Welcome to another edition of The Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and we're out here today in beautiful Carpinteria and Carpinteria State Beach. Talking to three of Carpinteria's most important artists, Arturo Teo, Meredith Brooks Abbott, and Ted Rhodes. We're going to start by talking with Arturo Teo because his studio is just a block away from the beach. Let's go over and say hello. Arturo, it's great to see you. <laughs> well, we're sitting out here on the beach. We're pretty close to the bluffs um, uh, that are so important to you. We're about a mile and a half or so away from them. Yeah. This is the world's safest beach. Okay. <laughs> why, why, why is it so safe? It's just a Chamber of Commerce idea <laughs> that it is. And it is. <laughs> no, it's a gentle, um, you know, um, leveling. On right, the beach. right. Yeah. Well, Arturo, I'm, I always love to hear how artists found their way to where they are today. So give me a kind of a brief background about yourself as a painter. Okay, well, first I have to say my mom is a painter. She's an artist, uh, it was since before I was born. And she um, was selling artwork in Mexico in the famous Jardín del Arte. And she found somebody who wanted to bring her and make a lot of paintings for a hotel chain and she brought the whole family here to the United States okay and uh, this is when I was 14 but at that time I was you know her painting was a little bit of a cottage industry you mm -hmm. know we were the kids were doing stuff like I was uh, stretching, stretching the canvases, canvases and <laughs> yeah. painting the backgrounds and uh -huh. pretty soon painting also um, you know some details some figures and whatnot um, so since I was a kid I enjoyed messing around with the, um, you know, with the materials, painters. And then I went to high school um, in Santa Clara High School. And then I went to um, college at um, uh, San Jose State University. And there I met a, a mentor that was a, a really great teacher, Maynard Dixon Stewart. And I, I was uh, focusing on figures and um, uh, portraits, and I, I, my favorite artist was uh, uh, Velázquez, a uh, mm -hmm. Span Spaniard painter. But then, uh, when I left school, I found out very quickly that uh, you know people are not too willing to sit for you for hours and hours <laughs> without payment. And so I, uh, I very quickly, at the time, I was a very avid, I was a runner, mm -hmm. a long distance runner, and you know I, I moved here. And I started seeing just the beauty of the landscape here. And um, that got me thinking, well, you know, uh, it would be fun to get out and mm -hmm. paint this. And so from the first moment I went to the, just down there is the, the marsh in Carpinteria. From that moment on, I, okay, I found what I want to do, just paint the landscape. That's mm -hmm. it, you know, that's that combined um, like an art and sport. Like I said, I was very serious about running. And going outside and painting, it's a, it's it's a sport because you have to manage, you know, your your energy, your time, your focus, mm -hmm. your concentration. I mean, it's like you're performing on the spot. You're catching what you're seeing. You're you're chasing the light. You know, all that stuff. It just was fulfilling for me. You know, it's like I could use what I would do in the studio, mm -hmm. all calm and no rush and no nothing. Well, you know, with the figure is difficult, but. Um, it just clicked. And then I went back to my teacher, and that's what he did too. He was teaching us figure, and he, but his love was, was landscape. Uh -huh, yeah. yeah, so then I, I kind of got another round of instruction from him, you know, kind of like, well, what do you do when you go out, out there? And uh, then pretty soon here, I started hearing of Ray Strong and his group of students. 
So um, I was introduced to him, I met him, I, I, I fell in love with him. You and so many other people, and what was it about him that was so magnetic? Okay, well, I was 25 and he was 75 when I met him. He might have been younger than me in spirit, <laughs> you know. He had a lot of energy, a lot, just spirit is the word associated with him. He was enthusiastic. If he met you, he would say, that's a beautiful color in that shirt. Oh, that ring. Oh, you're, uh, you know, he would notice you and just connect with you right. in a minute. And then pretty soon, well, he, your poet, he, he was a poet too. Uh, didn't produce too much poetry, but when, if he was driving with you and he would go by a, uh, you know, a vineyard, an old vineyard, Look at them! They're deaf mutes trying to speak. You know. The, <laughs> so he had a great knowledge. line to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the mountains. Oh, the negligees coming off the mountain. Uh, okay. You know that kind of thing. And and, and that's conveyed in his paintings clearly. You know. Yeah. Well, and and so that's the the the, the thing is also that um, he had a deep um, connection with the world and reality in the sense of. You know, he wasn't just doing a surface, um, uh, not representation, but even a symbol of the landscape. He was thinking of the deep layers of, you know, energy and mm -hmm. time that created that. So it was um, kind of almost a scientifically uh, grounded mm. appreciation for, you know, for the reality. So he would, you know, um, Experience and describe the rhythms and the, you know, just just the forces, mm -hmm. the, all the stuff, the wind, you know, the waves. Talking all these to things us, that are we're we're, we're registering ourselves, sort yeah, of the, yeah. peripherally, but for him, that's a real visceral experience. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so it was powerful to meet him and uh, befriend him. At the time, I was making uh, frames mm -hmm. for myself, and I was doing well enough that. Um, and, and cheaply enough, <laughs> I was working like minimum wage or less, you know. And he was getting some work framed, and uh, I was framing for him, and we talked more. And so, uh, you know, he, he I, I was in love with him, but I know he liked me a mm -hmm. lot, you know, for some reason, whatever he mm -hmm. saw, whatever he appreciated about myself. And um, uh, we found out that we were reading the same book. This is, I'm telling you about the beginning of the Oak Group. Right. Now the Oak Group is, is an important group that now has been going for about 28 years here in, in, in Santa Barbara. And uh, what it is, is just a group of artists, including one photographer, Bill Dewey, that have um, had a purpose, and the purpose is to, you know, something bigger than our own uh, artistic careers. Mm -hmm. so uh, at first, it was to identify and try to protect the lands who, that were endangered. And there were several at the time that we were forming in 86. There was the Wilcox property, the Carpinteria Bluffs, um, Haskell's Beach. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there were several large, about 100, 120 acres of land that uh, some of them had plans for development already. Mm -hmm. So plein air painters would paint there and would be feeling all this angst about it's not gonna be here anymore, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be here. And feeling in a really powerful way that uh, once we lost them, this wouldn't be the same. So we spoke up, you know, through our love of painting. We, ne we never did sort of a, a political type painting, you know, we just did, spoke for the beauty that we saw in mm -hmm. these places and spoke of our love for it and spoke of you know that it was good for the community, but uh, you you also became very politically active too outside of the realm of painting. I, I did. I uh, I spent a lot of time involved in uh, you know city council, uh, planning commission, even to the point of sometimes coastal commission. Uh, I had to educate myself on how the you know how decisions are made, what the what the process is, what the whole the whole deal. So I. I learned about the local coastal plan, the general plan, you know, I, I almost, uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, it was almost like I, I, I could see myself as a real licensed advocate for mm -hmm. these places, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, I um, 
just felt called to protect them and to speak for them and to, you know, let the community know. As a matter of fact, at, at some point, it wasn't so much, you know, the, the, the fight was so lost at the time, you know, especially with the Carpinteria Bluffs, that my passion was really about saying to the city council and the developers, just say the truth. The truth is that when you destroy this place, that will be a class one unavoidable significant impact. They were saying we were going to put this town with so many condominiums and mm. hotels and this and that. There would be no impacts, you know. <laughs> so but I was I was just kind of going, okay, well, if you At must do this for tell the truth, yeah. reasons, then tell the truth. Yeah. And so uh, I, I, that's meetings and meetings and meetings. And, you know, so um, they finally had to admit it and all some, I'm convinced that there has been some um, divine inter intervention, you know, like um, um, allowing for the wonderful community that's, you know, kind of environmentally aware to put up the money, you know, put up or shut up and to buy these places. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it didn't only work on that community, but also worked on the people who were bent on developing, you know, they finally saw the light that, you know, it was better for everybody yeah, yeah. to do the right thing and, you know, allow the community to purchase these places. Well, and I think they're just so important because, uh, you know, when they're in perpetuity, there's going to be like in hundreds of years, you know, we won't be here, but... There'll be a lot more painters. People, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Painters they will be inspired. So the whole idea, the Oak Group and, and you know, communities is to be have a purpose that's bigger than yourself mm -hmm. you know we well, as we're talking I'm I'm getting really eager to, to want to see the paintings that you've made because they're so beautiful can we walk up the the, the road to your studio and take a look sure absolutely let's do that let's go these are the the palm lofts uh -huh. and uh, there's 34 units uh, and uh, Peter Lewis and his associates uh, who owns this gallery I was, uh, you know I'm the gallery director here I don't own this uh, they own this whole complex and it was primarily for artists this is Clarita Clarita come on let's go inside so this is a show called Go Figure you recognize some of the painters that's Meredith Pavlet right we're going to talk to her momentarily and I think you're going to see Mary Hebner over there one of our yeah. favorite guests and Isabel Green and Fred Gowland. So you're the you're the the director of this gallery. Yes. And, and you hang the paintings. I hang the paintings, and uh, the gallery to me is like a blank canvas, and I like to make the paintings are like the painting. Right. <laughs> well, we want to look at your stuff. Yeah, which is upstairs. my stuff is upstairs. I live upstairs at the gallery, which is pretty nice. Well, Arturo, I'll, I'll walk up here, and I think this is a great place for an artist to live. Oh, it is. It's actually the best unit. Ocean view. And <laughs> ocean view, view, yeah. And, and you got you, you got your paintings on all of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like this one is uh, in East Camino Cielo. That's where we go to celebrate Ray Strong's birthday. Okay. January third, he would have been 108. And it's got those nice soft uh, hills that that he loved so much. Uh, yeah, he painted there several times. That's why I feel his spirit is so strong there. We, 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 we went actually in back, to celebrate yeah. his birthday uh -huh. there many times. One time, uh, uh, Patricia Chitlaw did a belly dance oh, wow. for him with a sword. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Uh, so this three in the middle, that's the Carpinteria Bluffs. Right. This, um, uh, you'll talk to Ted Rhodes later on. So that trail there, his family uh, purchased the naming rights for it. So oh, the Fleming okay. Rhodes Trail or the vice versa. Uh, some small ones, uh, more Mesa. This is just uh, down where we were at the beach. I paint a lot of the state park oceans. I talk a little bit about size and I know that Meredith tends to paint on a fairly small canvas yeah. and you obviously don't mind painting pretty big canvases. Well, no, I showed you my easel. I have a heavy easel and it allows me to mm -hmm. do big paintings on location. That's a problem because somebody says that a canvas uh, which is four sticks and you know cloth. It's the same thing as a kite. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> <Or> <laughs> it's sail. easy to go flying. Picks yeah. up, picks up the wind, yeah. and you're gone. 
Uh, so I have a heavy e easel that allows me to just work in on wind, which is the main mm -hmm. problem when you're out there, and the steadiness of, of, of something. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, uh, uh, the small ones are great because they're less of a commitment. You can do mm -hmm. them in one shot, you know. And do you ever do much touching up when you come back to the studio? Yeah, well, not much to the studio, but I, I go several mm -hmm. times to the, the oh, place. Oh, back to the spot, okay. Back to the spot uh -huh. when, when it's a big painting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Well, how, now, how do you handle light for that? Because obviously, even if you go at the exact same time of day, there's going to be clouds and well, things are going to shift. Yeah. Well, you try to go back um, fairly soon after you started, so that the, the at least the season the season's the same, and, right. the, and the, the the way the sun you mm -hmm. know uh, throws the light at different times of day is consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, but even when you when you finish a, a painting on location on one time, you start. Hopefully, I mean, and I mean to do this, I, I have to start by being um, excited about what the light play is, you know, just, just what's happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. So that's when you start, but then you have to keep that feeling and, you know, a couple hours from there, you're still, you're working from the memory of that moment a little bit. Or else you can be a fool as type mm -hmm. following the light, and then you're going to end, end up with mud. You know, mm -hmm. nothing mm -hmm. is uh, what 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 you first saw. So, yeah, you have to uh, even when you're in front of the subject, you have to keep present to your initial the initial impact and the initial way it was. Mm -hmm. well, we got a, a big a big painting right over yeah. here. Um, is this relatively recent? That is the bluffs. No, that is not. That's okay. a couple of years old. Uh, it is the, the 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 bluffs is now preserved in perpetuity, but part of it was not, and that is an agricultural production right now. So mm -hmm. this is a fallow field over here, and then there's, you know, they have plastic tarps and this and mm -hmm. that, but that is in the foreground of of the trees that are actually yeah uh, preserved and protected for perpetuity. It's unusual. I mean, some people when when you get to preserve places, then the, um, you know people want to have everything native and whatnot, and sometimes eucalyptus suffer because of that. And painters love eucalyptus, and scientists don't, not so much. <laughs> so we had to work hard to say, okay, this is a compromise. This is a historic thing. So we actually drew a bubble in a place where the eucalyptus have to be protected. Uh, okay, in that's perpetuity. great. So. That, the neat thing about the bluffs and the whole acquisition, the whole uh, given to the city, was that some a lot of rules were put in place, and and it was done by people who were actually involved, not a, just in the acquisition, but on the whole impulse of why to preserve it to begin with. Mm -hmm. So um, the artists are actually given a naming opportunity, like. I said somebody purchased, mm -hmm. so they were given this thing called the Artist's Passage. And that's to honor the involvement, because many artists, including myself and Meredith Abbott and Whitney, and many artists were actually part of the driving force of preserving these places. So um, just our opinion kind of matters now in the preservation. Mm -hmm. Talk us through, um, as we kind of finish up our, our conversation, these last uh, paintings on the wall. I, I see a, a painting that's not entirely made yeah. of landscape. I mean, there's a few buildings over here. Yeah, well, what, ha what happens is, again, this is the bluffs, and I told you I was a runner, so the paths are, to me, they're compelling because they're just kind of like an invitation to adventure mm -hmm. and this literally uh, you know this is towards Ventura which is the venture so this is a, really an invitation to adventure Ventura um, so you mentioned the buildings what that is is that uh, the Santa Cruz Island the central mm. uh, ranch and that's right. the sheep sharing shed okay. which is hard to say many times <laughs> and then that little church over there that's the San Ramon church which is uh, near Sisquoc and those vineyards there are uh, Rancho Sisquoc. Okay. Yeah. Everything else looks like it's just my neighborhood here at the State Park. Well, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful work, and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Very nice meeting you. Thank you. Have fun with my friends. We'll, we'll look forward to it. Okay.
extraordinaire of the Oak Group. Let's go up and meet Meredith. Meredith, I see I just happened to catch you here at your front gate. Hey, thank you. <laughs> nice to see, see you. Let's go someplace and talk. Okay. Well, you got a huge garden back here. A big yard. This is my sanity. Yeah. Your painting is not your sanity, huh? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a nice um, compliment. Nice balance, yeah. yeah. It's sort of the same thing. Compose a garden the same way you do. Yeah. Meredith, I look over my shoulder, I see this beautiful old house. How did, how did you come to, to live there? Uh, my husband was born here and raised here when he was a little guy. And then his parents built a house on the other side of Carp Maria. So this place was rented out for about 30 years. Wow. We moved back here 40 years ago and have tried to restore it as well as we could. Mm -hmm. But old houses take a lot of care and restoration. We just had the foundation redone this wow. year. That was a big job. Well, and, but, you know, and the garden, you've obviously put a, a ton of work into. It's evolved. Um, it changes all the time. I take things out and put things in. And now I'm trying to simplify more because I can't keep up with it as yeah, well as yeah, I used to. Yeah. So I'm trying to keep it simpler and use more natives and things like that. But that, that process of taking things out and putting things in is very much like what a painter does. <laughs> a good segue. And then you also... Uh, it evolves as a painting. You need areas that are calm and quiet, and you need areas that maybe have a lot of color and mm -hmm. are rambunctious. And so it's it's the same thing. Composing one of my one of my boys is a wonderful landscaper, and uh, he was going to be a landscape architect. And he worked with Sidney Baumgartner every summer when he was a kid, and um, he's very good at it. And I always say, when you're here, will you help me with mm -hmm. this? He's in New Hampshire now, and he's <clears throat> working for the land trust there, so he's again in an environmental um, business that, that is very good for him. He's very good at what he does. Well, let, me, let me segue with that to, to, to talking about your, your own painting. I mean, you're uh, kind of a founding member of the Oak Group with mm -hmm. Arturo Teo, who we've just been speaking with. Um, and, and partly that has to do with preserving the environment. Um, tell me a little bit about the, your, your background as a painter. I always, I think every one of us in our family is a painter except for my brother. Mm. I have four sisters who are artists and um, we were always encouraged and we played games that were art games when we were kids growing up. Um, I went to uh, art school, I went to um, Los Angeles well, what is it called? It's now in Pasadena, but it's Art Center School. Mm -hmm. And um, I, my major was illustration because I figured I'd had to make a living. And you can't just jump into painting and expect somebody to buy it. So um, I worked in New York for, I think, two or three years as, a, as an illustrator. And, uh, but I was always painting on the side, doing portraits or um, going up into New England where my sister's father-in-law was a painter. Mm -hmm. And I worked with him, his name was Merriman, a very well-known painter, um, would be better known if he had had galleries and had exposed himself more to um, that kind of thing, but his work was so popular that it was practically sold off the easel, oh, wow. and that's what he did. Uh -huh. He was a wonderful portrait painter too. After I left New York, I worked in San Francisco re-illustrating re -illustrating children's uh, school books. Um, at the time, they wanted them to be um, um, mixed in generation and mixed in um, eth 
ethnicity, and so that that's what I did. I re-illustrated those, and then um, I was got a, a gallery over in Marin County, and I um, I painted for that gallery for a while, and then uh, when we moved down here, then I I married Duncan when we were up there, and we decided to move back down here because this place really needed some work. <laughs> And so we moved back down here about 40 years ago, and we've been here ever since. Yeah. And you've been yeah. painting the landscape yeah. since then. Been painting this landscape for about 50 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in the same way as you reinvent a garden, you have to reinvent yourself as you keep painting in the same area over a long mm -hmm. period of time. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to go paint the same thing over and over again because I know it's a popular view or mm -hmm. a popular thing or a pot boiler or whatever you want to call it. So I think I'm in the process right now of trying to look at things differently, um, compose a little differently. And how? And it's... not anybody, maybe nobody else would know that but me. Okay. Um, just, you know, change your composition, change the abstract design mm -hmm. of a painting, um, change your viewpoint. Um, change your time of day even or whatever mm -hmm. um, right now I'm not usually painting on Monday and Tuesday because I have four grandchildren <laughs> you're babysitting take care of. <laughs> and then Wednesday I start painting again and then you know Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday. Right. so I still get enough painting time but as I say it's different it's different every time in your life is different you have different things pulling on you and calling for your attention and um, I think that's important. And these little kids grow so fast. I've already got one grandchild in kindergarten, and so I don't take care of her anymore mm -hmm. on, on uh, Monday morning or Tuesday morning. So. You kind of miss that? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I miss her. I miss her. Talk about your, your process when you're actually out there in the open painting. What, what's that like? Your, your, uh, your canvases are pretty small, generally, would you say, right? Outside, um, as big as I usually paint outside is 30 by 40, Okay. which is pretty big if you get a little gust of wind that goes over like a <laughs> sail you know and I can paint in the snow and practically the rain but um, but I can't paint in the wind okay. the wind bugs you when you're painting um, I think it's always embarrassing at first when I'm painting I don't know why I'm embarrassed once I get in that zone I'm okay but setting up and you know, people coming up to you and talking and, and that sort of thing. I don't know. It's it's embarrassing. You're doing, you're doing something in public that is a sort of a private right. thing. And, and do people come up and say, "Hey, what are you doing?" Yes. <laughs> and I was just uh, when we were just over in Normandy painting. This woman Norman came up to me and she was speaking French a million miles an hour, which didn't work for me. <laughs> but anyway, she started picking up the paints out of my paint box and what is this? You know, qu'est-ce que c'est? Qu'est-ce que c'est? And I'm like. Oh, uh, it's American brand paint, you know, it's probably Windsor Newton or something, but, uh, but it is, it's, um, and, and I, I paint alone a lot, um, I also, Whitney and I paint together, mm -hmm. and that's wonderful, and what we love to do is find a place where you're not going to be in Interrupted. the public, uh, but, yeah. but there's so many beautiful things in the area, Santa Barbara area, that are, you know, right mm -hmm. out there with the people, and right out there with the public, like, you know, the architecture in Santa Barbara is beautiful, and I love, I love painting buildings yeah. as well as landscape. And uh, do people recognize you or, or your yeah. work? Uh huh. Yeah. So they're, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Well, I know who you are. <laughs> yeah, yes. I'd love if you don't mind to to, to, to mosey on over to the studio and, sure. and see if we could kind of see where it happens. Mm -hmm. Let's do okay. it. This is where it happens. So it, it's a it's a big space. I see a, you got a stove over there in case it gets cold. It gets very cold. Does it really? Oh yes. Yeah. It gets it gets colder than the rest, and this is insulation uh -huh. up here, but it um, yeah it still gets very cold in and, here. And we got a big down to the 30s. Does it really? Wow. Yeah. So you're out here in, in gloves? 
I or you just the fire and you start the sometimes fire. Sometimes what uh-huh. I'll do is start the fire before I walk the dog, oh, and wow. then I'll go walk the dog. And by uh-huh. the time I get back, it's warmer. Okay. But um, well, tell me about the curtains and the light here. Okay, this is almost a north light, mm-hmm. which is wonderful to paint with. And um, I made the curtains because in the summertime the light does get in here because of the slant of the glass, and because it's not quite north. So I can pull the curtains and get the sun out of here as much as possible because it, a bounce light will make your paint shine. Okay. And uh, so you try and keep it as, as simple as possible with the north light. It's a cool light and that makes the shadows warm, mm-hmm. which is really something I like. Now, I, I see there's, there's spots for Freddie to relax. <laughs> so he's part of, he's present. He's definitely part of the scene here. And, and, and as you were mentioning the, the vases, uh, there they are over there. There they are. Um, They've all been painted many a, a times. A lot of stuff as in any artist's studio. Um, photographs tacked to the wall. There's a dollhouse over here. Well, yeah. What's this all about? Well, this is something Whitney and I made when she was a little... I my. My other children were twins, uh-huh. and when you have twins, your older child gets kind of gets backseated for right, a little while. Right. So this was a project we started when the twins were born, and um, it's—I mean, it's amazing. And she's got little tiny paintings uh, in there that are Matisse's and Degas uh-huh. and things like that. And, we made all the dolls. And so Whitney was interested in art from an early yes, age? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, it, was, it was great. You knew that. And gosh, this is just family pictures that I like to look at. And uh-huh. like well, take um, me deeper into the studio here. I see there's a ton of brushes and paints over here. <laughs> um, there, there's a little angel. <laughs> hey. I, I know, I've forgotten where she came from. Uh-huh. A putti, that's called. Yeah, it is a putti, um, isn't it? If you're tall, you hit your head on it. Yeah, I, don't I may hit my head on this as well, too. <laughs> this studio used to come to here. Oh, wow. And I got a commission um, to do a lot of huge paintings for a hotel in Monterey. Ah. And so with that commission, we made the studio twice as large. Okay. Which was great, because it gives you space to walk back. Right. And if you're painting big... Um, I mean, even sometimes if I'm painting, I don't mean to film it. This is this brush changes your attitude towards your your work. But painting big, you really need to be back. Mm-hmm. However, you have to keep your turps down on the floor oh, if you're okay. painting with a brush uh-huh. this big, okay. because you can't keep shifting back and forth. Now, is this all work in progress or completed work? All the stuff we're looking um, at. Some of these. Um, this is an example of something I might do. That that little painting was done on location, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's a, a light that lasts for maybe five or ten minutes. Oh, okay. So you can't paint anything this large from that. I mean, from the scene itself. So what I do is I do a sketch, and then I will and then you go to down the here. And, okay. And, um, and work from the little sketch. Okay. Now, is this from your trip to France? That's from the trip to France. Okay. Yes. Chicken farm. Yeah. And um, here's here's another one from. That's that's called the winter coat, and the cows over there were just getting so furry. They were looking more like bears, but they were. Yeah, that's great. And. Um, and how about this over here? That was for a benefit. Mm-hmm. We do a lot of benefit um, shows. Mm-hmm. And the Casa del Herrera, that was a painting for that. And what we do is we go and we paint on location there. And, um, and then the show consists of the paintings we've done there and any others that we might think would work for okay. that audience. And, um, and then the Matilla Hop Poppies are... I paint them usually every year, and I try and trick myself into painting and seeing them differently or mm. doing something different with the composition every year. Well, I see portraits along the wall over here, too. Yeah. That one is um, Whitney painting. This is Whitney when she was a little girl, and that's Whitney when she was a little girl. This is my son, um, my son William's husband, and that's Whitney. And Whitney and I give each other posing time for Christmas every year, uh, and so I pose for her, and she poses for me. That's and great. I, and now look and at all the the dogs. That's here. my that was my dog Leo. That you were just uh, rhapsodizing. He, <laughs> yeah, he lived in here a lot uh, too. Wow. And um, 
I'd be painting away and he'd take a pose and I couldn't resist it, so I'd turn around and paint him. Now I see a bunch of old National Geographics behind that. Do you use them very often? <laughs> no. I used to when uh -huh. I was an illustrator. Um, I, they're wonderful reference right, because right. everything's on the outside, right. um, all the subject matter. Right. And I think that's why I started even saving them was because they were good references. Mm -hmm. But um, I need to get rid of them. <laughs> like, I need to get rid of a lot of stuff. But um, but this is this is a place when you come in. Uh, do you always feel okay? I'm I'm happy to be here. Yeah. 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 It never and, feels like a grind. Oh no, no, no! I love it, and I love the process of painting. So that you know, when I start, it's exciting. I think the hardest thing about any um, process is to keep yourself excited about it so when you start you just maybe you've pre-visualized something but by the time you're halfway there you're going oh i gotta keep that enthusiasm going and um especially with a big painting and how do you do it um you just it's a mind job it's mm -hmm. a mind job and you just keep saying i love bringing this out putting that back whatever you know whatever you're doing with the painting so, um, no, I, I, I find that this is um, such a meditation anyway, too, mm -hmm. so that's part of it. Mm -hmm. You can really get into that space where any interruption is kind of awful. Unwelcome, yeah. at least, <laughs> to yeah. say the least, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, as, as we kind of conclude, Meredith, I would be interested to, since you've been painting for such a long time, to for you to, to, to give some advice to, to younger painters? What would you say to, to people who, who are, you know, invested in the process, but maybe thinking, gosh, it's so hard to make a living. It's so hard to live in this town, for instance. What, what, what would you say to those folks? Well, what, you, you, you will get good at something that you do every day and that you do enough of. I mean, it's like your photography or your, your filmmaking or whatever. If you've done it enough, you're going to know how to do it and something's going to happen where there is going to be an audience for it, I think, eventually. I got very lucky because I, I was with, I, you know, my training was really good. Um, it was very, very adequate for making a living as an illustrator it was that i i thought when i was a kid i would always be an illustrator i thought i would want to do children's books or something it didn't happen um i did a couple of books when i was back east but it didn't lead anywhere um fortunately for us <laughs> as yeah, your uh, but I think, fans i think my advice is you just got to do it mm -hmm. and i think you also this doesn't apply to every art form, that's for sure, but I think drawing is so important. And I think that's why I go to that class at night, is because it just tunes you up, and the drawing gets into the paintings. Even with you're working with a brush and working with a shape, the shape has to be right, the brush stroke has to be right, um, and that's all in the drawing. Mm -hmm. So um, my advice would be just do it. Um, I wish Robert, uh, he doesn't get to paint as much as he wants to because he's so involved with the farmer's market. And um, that's his living, that's what he's doing. He's growing a lot of stuff for the markets. And it's a huge, huge commitment and a very, very hard way to make a living. Um, but he paints in the winter time because that's when the markets are mm -hmm. down. He mm -hmm. doesn't have as many flowers. He doesn't have as much stuff. So he paints in January, February, March. When so he's when you can, so, yeah. yeah. So I can show you some of his work here. Um, this is this is one of his paintings. Mm -hmm. This is one of his paintings. Here's Whitney painting, and that's my eldest grandchild uh, painting. And keeping the family it, tradition alive. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Whitney's work is also just, you know, she, she works as much as she can right now, yeah. which is when I, she works when I'm taking care of the children, right. and she works on the weekends, and yeah. she works when both children are in school, and that's good, so. Well, it's been, it's been a, a, a 
pleasure just to, to get to know where all this great work takes place. I mean, so much of it takes place outside, but this is kind of where it finishes. Um, thank you so much for inviting well, us into your home. Thank you for doing this. This is a lot of fun, and I hope it works. It so, will. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, great. Well, we're here now for our final guest of the day, photographer Ted Rhodes. Let's go in and meet Ted. Well, hi, David. Good to see you. Come on in. Thank Welcome you. to my studio. Well, now, Ted, you brought me here into this uh, magical studio of yours. Now, there's a lot of photographs on the wall. There's a lot of musical instruments as well, too. Are you a musician? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a hack at a lot of things. No, <laughs> no I, I enjoy music. I enjoy listening to music. Um, I've been playing harmonica for about 30 years. I, I played flute when I was in high school, and I, I picked up the guitar about eight or ten years ago. My, my son Jesse's been playing since he was eight, and uh, I'm trying to catch up with him. But um, I enjoy music a lot. I go to a lot of music festivals, and I've actually started a, a weekly Americana Music Circle here in Carpinteria for any musicians that want to no, what, come what is that by. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a local coffee shop that opened a couple of years ago called the Lucky Llama, which is a really nice venue. And uh, on Friday afternoons and mid to late afternoon, uh, people can come by uh, with a cover song or an original song and uh, play with a, in a circle of people. And anyone that wants to take a solo can kind of take a solo. It's kind of that improve people's musicianship, but also just to just to, uh, get together over music. Well, I'm interested in that because I, it, it seems to me like your career has been one that would be open to that, that sort of thing, and was, you know, playing music and starting a music. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I worked in the film business. Uh, actually, I started out kind of what, what these guys are doing that are, are filming me. Uh, started out as a one-man film crew, 16-millimeter film crew back in the uh, actually, I went back to the Midwest. I grew up in, in Pasadena, California, but I went to school in the East. I went to Dartmouth College, and then I spent five years in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana in the poverty program. I started an underground newspaper, and, and as an offshoot of that, I started doing some new stringer work. And then I got back into a, an earlier love of film, and I, I was a one-man film crew, but it was a much different era. Uh, to make this kind of film that you're making today, would have cost ten or twenty thousand dollars back then. You would have had to have a, a Nagra tape recorder, and you would have had to edit the sound, you know, process the the sound and put it onto film and and A and B roll and do all of that stuff. And I thought that was something I wanted to go into, but I ended up going down to Hollywood and following the path of least, least resistance. Uh, and um, and you were a key grip. Now that's a term that people hear a lot, but may not necessarily know what it is. Well, it really, just means you're the head grip. And obviously, I, I didn't start out as the head grip. Uh, I worked as an electrical best boy and as a gaffer, uh, but I felt kind of into the grip department and and hooked and up the with working the, the getting the cameras organized and it's uh, a matter of fact i made a one hour film called electric shadow um about what gaffers and grips and best boys do um but grips uh we we also do a lot of the lighting but you know some of the lighting is is attached the, the light control media is attached to the lights and, and the electricians do that uh the grips also have a lot of light control media uh, for example in georgia the jungle my grip crew and uh, second unit crew and rigging crew, we had, um, we flew over the set, it was a jungle set, 80 feet wide, 300 feet long, uh, indoors in a hangar, uh, Hughes, the Hughes aircraft hangar. We flew 40 20 by 20 foot pieces of taffeta over the set that we reefed in and out on rope. And I figured about seven and a half miles of rope. We put uh, several hundred feet of rock and roll truss up. We hung, all, uh, a whole bunch of uh, what we call chicken coop lights. Um, there's, there's a lot of rigging, backings, then all the moving shots, the dolly shots, rigging of cameras. You know, I've rigged cameras underwater on fire trucks, on motorcycles, on cars. Um, well, what are some of the films that, that you've worked on? Um, well, I hooked up with a, a director of photography uh, uh, named Tom Ackerman, who uh, lives here. In, in, in fact, he, he followed me up here to Santa Barbara, but I moved up here a few years before him. But um, with him, I did uh, Back to School and Beetlejuice and National Lampoon Christmas Vacation, um, The Muse, 
Um, and I've worked on some others. I'm, we did a, a, with him, we actually did a lot of uh, commercials and a lot of rock videos back mm -hmm. when those were a going thing. Um, but being a technician in Hollywood, you work on a little bit of everything. Uh, you work on industrial films, you work on, you know, you just... Whatever comes up. I worked on an animated version of Lord of the Rings with Ralph Bakshi, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're out on a dry lake bed on a camera car with black riders chasing you, and you go, ah, there isn't anything better than this. But then when you're doing five days of British toilet paper, you're going, mm, maybe this, maybe I could, I could have been a contender. <laughs> you know? But it's interesting because this, what I'm doing now, um, I've stepped back from the film business. Um, I mean, I basically I've retired from the film business, but I'm pursuing all of those things that I couldn't do when I was working as a technician. And it's even worse now. I mean, before, if someone called you for a job, they might give you uh, the end of the day. If they'd worked with you before, the word of mouth thing really helps you. Uh, I mean, it hinders you when you're trying to get into the business, but then when you develop a reputation of giving 100%, and I like to think the crews I put together gave more than that, but of course, Technically, technically, you can't do that, but I always said we gave 110%. You have good attitude. There's so much insecurity in the film business that when you do start working, then, then uh, you become in demand. And, um, you know, a lot of the things that I, that I learned in the film business, uh, I've been able to bring to still photography, and I'm, I'm pursuing now things that I wasn't able to do in the film business because you're, you're on demand and you can get a call like instantly, oh, I have to be somewhere tonight, you know? Like someone once called me, uh, the call time is three o'clock. I said, is that morning or, or afternoon? Because I've been called for them all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But now I'm pursuing like certain musical endeavors and certain fine art endeavors and picking and choosing. I have a couple of commercial clients, but I'm, I'm not on the hustle, what I call the industrial yeah. hustle. And so I don't have to worry about my phone ringing and and having to go off somewhere, although I, I do work as a political activist, so sometimes I do get pulled into some pretty big causes up here. But I, I've, been, I've learned how to say no, so when I take something on, it's, I know that I'm committing to a lot of time to do that. One of the things that, that I wanted to talk to you about was the fact that you have this connection with our two previous guests, Artur Teo and um, Meredith uh, Brooks Abbott, um, you've worked on them. We look over here, there's your country road uh, at the bluffs is a, a photograph. Um, you were really important in, in making sure that, that the bluffs, uh, uh, the Carpinteria bluffs maintain their integrity, along with so many other people. But um, uh, talk to me a little bit about the, the art scene and the sort of political commitment that, that a lot of the, the Carpinteria artists ha have shown. Well, it's interesting. Um, uh, I've said this uh, to a number of people, but there is an untold story about how the artists uh, back in the 80s, uh, especially the Oak Group uh, that was very strong in Arturo Teo and Kai Abbott, uh, they really started to articulate visually what was special about the bluffs. And, and it was their work in the 80s and since then that, you know, appeared on sweatshirts, on t-shirts, on, on posters. And, and then I... And in some ways, Arturo, um, who had become a friend of mine because we, we really were heavily involved in, in, the, in the political fight uh, back in the, in the 80s and 90s, and then in the late 90s, I spearheaded the, the fundraising effort, which was also a heady thing. But um, yeah, the, the poster project was, I feel honored to be included in that because certainly Meredith Abbott and Arturo were, uh, were very much established uh, artists and uh, Ellen Easton, who represents Arturo, uh, uh, and, so many of the Oak Group, and, and yeah. many of the Oak Group painters uh, helped put together this poster project idea and included me at, because I had been starting to document the bluffs uh, in all different seasons and starting to use that. And, and so um, it was funny when you called me today, I said, oh, that, that's an interesting connection because we still do have those posters. We, we still are are selling them, though not now, to raise money for the bluffs. But it, it helped to put that image out there. And um, at some of these public hearings where development was being proposed for the, the bluffs, um, you know, the developer or the architect would come and uh, they always bring a, a big plan and, and they have all the trees in the front so you can say, oh, that's not going to be so bad. But then Arturo would come and put an easel on the other side 
of the bluffs with no buildings and right. said, no, that's open space, because right. the de developers would be claiming, we're going to create open space out there. Well, no, the open space is already out there. <laughs> but, but again, it, just, it, it spoke to me of the power of, of uh, visual communication. Right. And, well, and, 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 and that's also speaking to me as I look over my shoulder and around the corner here. I mean, that's the main thing I wanted to talk to you about today was, was your own photography. So uh, kind of talk me through some of these images, some of the, 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 the photos you've taken recently that are important to you. Well, I had, um, as you can see, looking around, I get, I mean, I'm part photojournalist and, and then part struggling fine artist, I guess you could say. Um, but I've, and I've shot lots of, I mean, I, I'm very quick in, in shooting like uh, children, and, you know, you, don't, you can't hesitate, you know, when you're, um, or shooting musicians, you know, I love to shoot musicians. I'm one of the official photographers for the Santa Barbara Blues Society. So, so one aspect of, of the photographs here, um, actually behind you are um, photographs from a show I did recently called Box Set of Blues, which I had at a small venue, but it was a, a, a a jean store called Vintage Blues, and it seemed like the perfect venue. And and actually, the owner is also someone who has purchased several of my non-musician works. So uh, she was really excited to to have the uh, show there. And uh, so a lot of these are photos that I've shot at that venue. Though um, you know, some of the photographs are used by the Blue Society or sent to the magazines for articles that that the, the president. Uh, writes an article for a national magazine, but sometimes I also shoot a little more art artsy stuff at, on the side when I'm doing that. Well, I mean, as, as a blues harp player, or, or do you find that you have some sort of insight into what's happening on the stage that you might not otherwise? I think as a musician I do. Um, I mean, the, the, the film is getting faster and faster in terms of, uh, well, for those that aren't photographers, that you can shoot at, at low and lower light levels. but. Uh, there's, there's a photograph behind you that I use for my business card uh, of a, this is um, Joe Kincaid, but I, I shot this in, uh, at a very, very, uh, like a 60th of a second, you know, in, in horrible lighting conditions. But um, as a musician, I, I could wait for the moment, you know, so, and, it's, and, I, and I, there's something about uh, having to work with with pressure that I get more creative sometimes with musicians like that it can be just this terrible venue ugly walls and I and I wait till I get the glint on the guitar or the, or the cock of the head just right and 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 I find that challenging but it also gets my adrenaline going or if I'm taking a group picture of six musicians five musicians on the stage I'm looking to see that the, they're all clear, like the drummer's not hidden behind the cymbal, but there, there's also an interesting composition going on and the lighting, so you, you look and at- That's a real split second and, and And as photographers know, you already have a lot of things, especially in old school photography, now with digital cameras, there's, there's a few less things that you have to do because some of these auto functions can still get you a decent picture, but if you're composing a picture like that, you're still, you're looking at about five or six layers of things that you want to have happen. So that's one aspect that um, that I enjoy doing, one, one focus on my photography. But I had a show called a Mirror Images a couple of years ago, and, and a number of these images behind us are from that. Uh, and they're all reflected images where I would, I would find a pool and where there, there was a certain lighting condition. And, and a couple of them I, I posed. Uh, there's a, a series I did called Water Dancer where uh, there's a woman wearing a, a white shirt, and I posed it in a certain condition, but it was a tricky shot because it was windy. Mm -hmm. I wanted dapple light on the background, but the, the pool itself had to be dark. And, uh, and then there were water bugs skimming along. So the, mm -hmm. the one photograph that uh, I really like up from that series, uh, a water bug landed uh, right to make almost a halo on the, uh, on the woman. And so these aren't really, um, you know, these aren't Photoshop effects. I don't really go into that kind of, I mean, I use Photoshop, the computer program, just to do what you would do if you were in a dark room, you know, light, you light or dark in a certain uh -huh, range. Yeah. But, um, and then um, I also get intrigued with, with geometry of architecture. I have some uh, images that, it, 
that, for example, the Chicago skyline where, where you see a building reflected against another building and you have sort of competing uh, geometry going on there. I, I know you, you told me you have a, a child at the Santa Barbara Middle School, which is a great creative school. Um, I, I've done thousands of images at that school. Some of them quite, have become iconic images for the school, but um, one of my favorites is this homecoming. I, I'm looking up here at mm -hmm. a photo, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, when the they, homecoming, they were, when, their, when we were at the St. Anthony, Ser yeah. Yeah, the Saint Anthony Semer Seminary at the end of the fall trip, and they'd come in and wind into a yeah. tighter, tighter circle, which I think is still done, but not in the same venue. But Well, it's interesting to bring that up. My daughter is in the a photography class there at, at the Santa Barbara Middle School, and that is truly one of the things that they emphasize is to take a lot of photographs. So she'll come back and show me what she's got from one day, and she'll literally have 300 photos um, from that day. Well, that's funny. I'm, I'm not sure I would do exactly the same approach, but I, I occasionally do this, this one day uh, high school photography thing for the, uh, a group in, in Carpinteria. And what I try to get kids to do more than taking a lot of shots is to challenge them to, to, to do the kind of shooting they wouldn't necessarily do, like get down on the ground and look up or mm -hmm. do a wide angle mm -hmm. or, matter of fact, I have a statue I, I could show you outside. One of my influences was my mother who was an excellent uh, nature photographer, uh, worked with a Leica all her life. She, I think she could have been a pro and she was also a natural uh, filmmaker. She had a 16 millimeter camera, uh, steady as a rock on her pans and, and, mm -hmm. and shots. Um, but she was just an amateur photographer, but she taught me this, this really to get down and dirty when you're taking a picture and it was a little sculpture that my my dad uh, commissioned from the wife of his law partner who was mm -hmm. using sculpture as a way to help uh, I, uh, I don't know if it was cancer victims I can't remember but um, uh, so he commissioned her from a photograph of my mom so that's now sitting out there so uh, that, that sense of being right there close down working hard that's kind of part of what your aesthetic is all about yeah, and you know, it was uh, Robert Cabba that said, you know, it, it, if it's something to the effect of if, if your picture isn't good enough, you're not close enough. Of course, he got too close when he was in Vietnam. <laughs> but, but, but uh, yeah, I, I find like I, when I shoot portraits of people, I, I really don't like to have posed pictures. I mean, I can do a posed picture, but I've gotten some of my best photos of people by by taking the picture, you know, like if, 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 if you didn't know that I was a photographer or, or you didn't know I had my camera with me, like, like, let's see right now, and I, and I just came up and went, David, and, and, and I get that first little smile that you just gave me, where a lot of people come up, David, and then, you know, then by the time, time they time take the picture, yeah. you're looking like, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> let's finish this right, interview. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that element of surprise is important. I've got, I've got some, I do like the, uh, you know, capturing people that, whether I know them or don't know them. Uh, um, the, the one, one of my photographs that's been pretty popular is one I took in Sevilla, and it's actually my son and daughter walking, walking, walking up a rainy street, street, but yeah. I call it under, under my brother's umbrella. It has a, it's somehow uh, people find compelling whether or not they know, in fact, they don't know who they are and, and, and I, I've learned my lesson on, on telling when I do a pose shot of, I've, I've realized too much yeah people sometimes will not buy something if they know who the person is because I don't always use a professional model so right. um, you know uh, it's, it's funny you know uh, if you want to insult a, 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 a photographer unless, unless you're really a serious photographer people always say well what camera did you use and uh, in fact, it's not about the camera, it's about the moment. And, and what re I really enjoy about photography is that moment. And, and I think starting out, as you say, going out and shooting 300 photos, that's good. But to me, it's, it's more the Ansel Adams stalking, you know, waiting stalking for that moment, shot. or where you see that moment grabbing it. And like I was on a trail where a number of people had walked by this thing, and I, but I just stopped and I looked down and I saw these leaves and needles floating and, and the clouds behind them and I went that's that's a great composition mm -hmm. and what I love is uh, that's been bought by several people but um, at the at the show that I featured that at 
someone came up to me and asked me, what camera did you use? And I went, <laughs> yes, because I used a little point and shoot on that one. And I was you like, and I, yeah, and I wanted to give my little lecture about, it's not about the camera. Well, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, Ted. Thank you so very much. Well, thanks for being here. Well, as the sun sets on the oak trees of Carpinteria, it's time to say goodbye for another episode of The Creative Community. Thanks as always to our sponsor, the Diana and Simon Rob Foundation, and thanks to today's guest, Arturo Teo, Meredith Brooks Abbott, and Ted Rhodes. I'm your host, David Starkey, and thanks for watching.